and they are getting the vit uh, victory horns blown to them for them. I ask myself, as Africans, how best do we become aware of our past if the knowledge about who we are is not available to us? How do we emancipate even our minds from mental slavery? Ourselves, how do we get out of this? These people have created a mental bubble for us to be in them. So every now and then they told us several stories about the land, trying to put or discourage us from coming back home to the continent. For centuries, Africans were being played against each other. Some points they were telling us that, look, the land is a poor land, why do you want to go there? But then we ask ourselves, do you think Africa is poor? You've been coming here for so many centuries and be getting some, so many things from us, and you call us poor? Well, <coughs> you are poor. That's why you have to come back to Africa every now and then to get something, to go and better, uh, better your land. You even came for our ancestors to help you build your land. Then why do you have to call us poor? They told our people that, see, the land is a jungle. When you go there, you are going to be fed on by this wild animal. People live on trees. So many myths were told to our brothers and sisters out there. They went to the point by telling them that, look, your ancestors were sold because they were good for nothing. Their own brothers sold them. You see, in as much as I would want to fight for my ancestors by telling people that they didn't engage themselves in their trade, if I say that, I will be deceiving my own people. Yes, our ancestors engaged themselves in the trade, but in a different way. We would like to know who our, uh, our ancestors were. We would like to know our roots. But how do we do that? A lot of us no longer want to sit idle in the stage or wherever we find ourselves. We want to come back to the continent. So some of them are taking part in the ancestry DNA test. Mm -hmm. A percentage of your DNA gets you to know that you are from this tribe. The Igbo, the Gonjas, the Yorubas, the Evers, the Ashantis. You come back home to that. Then you build your uh, connection with these people. A lot more like, okay, let's go back home. Yen sign Kofa. How? Sign Kofa. <clears throat> let's get back to our culture. Retrieve something that was missing in the past. Let's get it. And that's why most of you are here today. Even though you've not taken... Uh, your ancestry DNA testing, we decided to come back to Africa, learn a bit of the culture. What is different? So that you use it to nurture your children and those that will come after them. When you look back a little, let's take a, tree, a critical look at that tree there. The tree there tells a story of who we are as Africans. Deep down the, the soil is the root that is holding the tree down. But on top, to a certain level, is just one trunk. On top of the trunk is two different branches. Our ancestors were one on the continent before they got separated. Some of them remained here, others were taken to the diaspora. They've been telling us that we sold you. I am a descendant of those who never were taken away. So then, I am a descendant of a betrayer to you. Some of them see me as such because of the stories they were told. And I wouldn't blame them because some of my ancestors engaged themselves in the trade. They told us on this continent that the people who were taken away were going to work. It, it will marvel you that, see, we are in Africa, but we don't know into depth the history of the transatlantic slave trade. Lately, it's been taught in school that the surface of it, they told us, oh, they were migrated to go and work. If I am understanding this statement, it means they are supposed to come back home. But then they didn't. They made their fortunes and refused to come back. So then I see you as a descendant of those who neglected their people. Do you think we will see each other eyeball to eyeball? We shall be fighting for centuries and we we'll never reunite with each other. But then we don't want to stay up there with their stories anymore. We wanted to come down. Then we decided to come out from the, down from the little, little branches. Then we see each other as one. We've all met at the bridge. When we look down, we realize we are all standing on one same tree. One root is holding us down. And that's where uh, Peter Tosh came in. It doesn't matter where you are. But as long as you are a black person, you are an African. You see, his statement is so beautiful. But then, when I look past, or I look through the continent, from Morocco, Sudan, Egypt, and several other places, not all Africans are black. 
But then there is one thing that connects us all, and that's the DNA. So then I rephrase these statements into it doesn't matter where you were born, it doesn't matter your nationality, but as long as you share that same DNA of your ancestors who are from the African continent, you are African. <coughs> You stand on the land that was once upon a time used as a slave market and a slave last bath. Nobody knows this day will ever come because they took them there. People who were rebelling, like the people of Jamaica, they took them to the island, left them there. Die, survive and let's see. But then they survived. That's how we are. Africans are supposed to survive anywhere they go then we are coming back home to the continent. Days, I mean, uh, years after our ancestors got in, uh, before Af uh, our ancestors got into these chains and shackles, nobody knows how the uh, land was being called. The land that was given the name Africa was a very big land. People call it Akebulan, meaning land of all creation, Garden of Eden, so beautiful. Look around. We have it all. Gold, ivory, everything. We have it all and then our ancestors were so much in love with each other. But they got to a point they fought among each other for territorial expansions. They had victims of wars. Initially, those victims of wars were never enslaved into chains and shackles. They never put them into chains. Those victims of wars were warriors. Some of them were families that surrendered. They inducted them into the various cultures. Various tribes took them. So then they were practicing indentured servitude. A whole family could go and serve the king and come back to their family houses or homes. But they were not in shape. The chief doesn't even own them. So then it was a practice of love, harmony. But then it got to a point. By 1471, under the leadership of Prince Henry the Navigator, the Portuguese arrived here on this land. They landed at Elmina. They were on their ships. Initially, they didn't have a place to come and sleep in. Uh, they don't have a home, like the castles. So then they were on top of the ships. They would come in, get some food stuff, and go back. By 1482, they established their post at Elmina. Castillo de Elmina was built in 1482. They started with the trade in gold, ivory, pepper, spices, and several other things. Our ancestors were getting wax prints, tobacco, whiskey, mirror, schnapps, and several other things that were not common to them. But time went very fast. One of their kind, Bartolomeo de las Casas, a Portuguese Roman Catholic priest, arrived here. According to people, he was the one who uh, introduced human trafficking or the shuttle slavery. But then I want to believe that statement, but I have another thing that I would want to believe. If you look at the ships these people sailed down to Africa with, the, the ships tell us different stories. Look, they have been here centuries before Bartholomew got here. They came with those ships. When Bartholomew suggested it, did you reconstruct the ships to move our ancestors? That's my question. No, they didn't. <coughs> They moved them with that same ship. So then, if I tell you today that these people knew exactly what they were coming here to do, would I be lying? Would I be wrong? Probably not. Because I've been putting articles upon articles, books upon books together to see if someone would just make a statement and assert that, okay, they reconstructed the ships before moving our ancestors. You sent the ships here before that gentleman came. So it means one thing. You were coming here for us as Africans, strong men and women, to go out there to help you. Bearing in mind that Africans were even traveling to Europe before you decided to come to Africa. So you saw how strong they were and you decided to come for them, enslave them and use them on your plantations. When they came here, he suggested it. The very first group of people they targeted were the victims of wars. They went to the chiefs. Telling them that, look, the people you have inducted into your cultures, even though it's so nice to have them with you, you are risking your family and your entire generation. Those people were war victims. Don't you think they are trying to learn your weaknesses? If they get to know more about you, they will strike 
and they will take all of you out. We want to help. We have guns and weapons of mass destruction. We will provide you with all these weapons. But then you will also have to give these people to us in return to go and work for us on our plantations. I always say our ancestors were so naive. How would you believe somebody who just got onto your land for a few years over somebody who has been with you? Centuries. If they would strike, they would have striked before the arrival of the Europeans, but they didn't. They wanted peace, and that's why they were with you. You believe them over your own people. They gave those victims of wars out, and that's whenever they tell us that, look, we sold each other, I never complained. I knew that this is a treat. So far as you took something in return, you have sold them. They went on for years. But then it got to a point the ancestors realized the mistake, the damages that were happening to them. Because these are strong men and women being taken out of the land. They stopped the fight. No more wars between tribes and communities. They are coming together to fight one battle. And that's the Europeans. They also realized that. So then the Dutch, the Danes, the Portuguese, the British, the Spanish, all of them came together to go into the interior. From the dungeons, they took their guns, went into the interior, started raiding from left, right, center, and then back. They went all the way to the northern territories of Ghana. They met with some individuals, missionaries. In Ghana, we call them the notorious slave raiders, Babatu and Samori. They helped them to go all the way to Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and then the various neighboring nations. They raided our ancestors. They had children, pregnant women, inclusively with the men, into these chains and shackles. They were made to walk for so many miles. According to a historian here in Ghana, Professor Akosia Adoma Pebi, in her book entitled History of the Indigenous Slavery in Ghana from the 15th century to the 19th century, she made us aware that out of the various slave markets we might have had here in West Africa, from Benin all the way to Gambia, Gold Coast had about 63 of the slave markets. Sampa, Salaga, Janani, Ketekrache, Bonomanso, Techiman, Picoro, Asemanso here, the dungeon at Cape Coast, Elmina, Fort Amsterdam, Fort Williams, all the way to the Christiansburg dungeon in Osu, Accra, just to mention but a few. There was once a British historian called W. E. Ward. He was traveling during the era of the slave trading. This British traveler kept a journal entitled The Short History of Gold Coast. In that book, he made a statement that out of the various slave markets we might have had here on this continent, Ghana alone, 63, but then among these 63, we have two playing a significant role. A same man to where we stand, and that of the Salaga slave market. Salaga was more like a link between Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, and Ghana. They will have to walk for over 400 miles oh to even get here, between Salaga and same answer. But for those who were captured from Burkina Faso and the other one, uh, countries, they walked multiples of the 400 miles. When they were coming, what made us aware that they were taken through a nature reserve called the Mole National Park. Today we could go for safari viewing, no big deal. But then in the days, the park was designated for animals like the lions, leopards, hyenas, all of them were there. When they got there with the captives, these animals were attacking our ancestors. The captors realized their commodities our ancestors were getting lost, so then the best way was to protect them. How they protected them was funny. They looked into the chains and shackles. The weaker ones were taken off. They walked them for a couple of meters, tied them to trees. Their backs were then whipped. The blood attracted the wild animals. They used them as bait to trade their ways through the park. When they got out of the park, they met this river called the Pra River, so huge and fast flowing. Our ancestors met the river, so many of them in chains and shackles, they couldn't cross. It took so many of them. It came to mind that these people are looking for the strongest. So they were trying to weed out the weaker ones by sacrificing their ways through it to get here. Before they could get here, the women together with some of the children were crying. They felt heartbroken that the men are there doing nothing to rescue them, to free them. So then what they were doing was to be crying out loud in a way that maybe somebody around the territories that they are going through would hear their voices and come to their aid. But then the Europeans saw their captors realized that and they had to shut them up. Shutting them up, they were using stones and metal masks on them. They picked stones that were a little bit wider than their mouths, 
stuff it in there and then had it tied around their necks. If they don't have to use that, they gather leaves into their mouth before covering it up with the metal mask. That way you as a human being, the tears will roll, but that sound of a cry stays down there. It doesn't come out. They got here so tired, hungry, dirty, weak, and very skinny. They got here, they needed to be fed not because they were hungry. These people fed them because they were looking too skinny. No buyer would want such a person. So they took the initiative of fattening them up, allowing them to rest so that they could get much money out of them. Whilst that was being done, the men with their hairs and beards bushy were being shaved off with broken bottles and knives. Mm. After that, they sorted them out according to ages. To determine their age groups, they will have to force their mouth open with the device called speculum oris. Count their teeth, the number of teeth they have in there, help them to determine which age group to put them in. After that, they walk them to the river for their final bath. But then, before we walk to the river, I want you to look on the walls. We have more of these portraits placed on the wall. The likes of Malcolm X, Queen Nanny of the Maroons in Jamaica, Padmore, Booker T. Washington, Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah, W.B. Du Bois, Marcos Mezea, Galvin Jr., Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., Frederick Douglass, and all these people. We have them placed on this wall based on the fact that they played a role in our life. For us to be here today, these people played a big <coughs> role yes. fighting for freedom and civil rights. So many of them were killed. Marcos Garvey talked about a bridge between the continent and then the African diaspora. A bridge that was once broken. We need to create that bridge for ourselves. And I believe that bridge is now in place. Year of return, <coughs> beyond the return, let's come back home to know who we are. If that's the bridge we are talking about. And so many events that take place in the, on the continent. We have them there to acknowledge the bravery of their performances and then all that they have put in place for us. We shall be taking the walk through this way, but then I would like to tell you about that ancestral graveyard. We have there three different graves. In that ancestral graveyard, we have the remains of Madame Crystal from Kingston, Jamaica. Once we are facing it, it's on our left-hand side. With the one in the middle, Sam Walker from New York City, United States. The last one is the bones of our ancestors brought back from Barbados by the Prime Minister herself, Mia Amomotli. In 1998, we celebrated the first ever emancipation celebration right here on this land. We saw the return of the bones of Madame Crystal from Kingston, Jamaica. Crystal was a captive from this land. She was taken in chains and shackles all the way to Jamaica. They got there, she wouldn't eat anything. And back in on a hunger strike, they needed to force her to eat, and that was when they were using the chisel and hammer method on her. She was caught in the act, so then they needed to find a way to get the food into the mouth. She's so strong, her jaws were tightly closed, so then they knocked the teeth out. Place the funnel, they dish the food into the funnel with the help of water, they push it down the throat to the stomach. That way she stayed alive. But she was a strong woman. And that's something that people <coughs> fail to understand. They think African women are stro uh, stubborn. No, yeah. You see, no, no, <laughs> no African woman who actually knows what she wants and focus committed to that is ever persuaded to change her mind. The woman has already taken that particular position. Commitment, focus, 100%. Each time she's forced to eat, she waits quietly after they have left. Her hands go straight into the throat and she brings everything out. She continued with that and died in the process. Her dying wish was to be brought back to this motherland. The chief priestess made sure her bones were preserved. They had her buried somewhere in Kingston. They planted a tree there. So when everything came to an end, they went for the bones. It was in 1998 that they flew the bones back home to this land. When they were bringing the bones, it came with the bones of Samuel Carson. Carson was once upon a time a very good man, served in the US Navy, one of the very first group of African Americans. Then he died. He wasn't even given a befitting burial. So then they needed to bring the bones back. His grandson called for the bones to be brought back. They flew the bones back to the airport. They moved them on a bus, a town in the central region, getting closer to Cape Coast, called Anomabo, used for a slave port. The youth there denied them access. 
telling the leaders that it is nice you are doing this, but the needed thing to do is to do it right. You should have shipped their bones back as the same way they left. They should return the same way. But then the answer, uh, leaders didn't do that, so they gave them a boat. They picked the bones onto these boats. They moved them across the ocean to the Cape Coast dungeon. Right there we have this door called Door of No Return. You walk through it in chains and shackles and there is no way you are finding yourself here ever again. It was true, the ancestors walked through it, couldn't return. But then the bones of these ancestors were brought back through that same door. From the, behind it, they pushed it open, the gate is now open. They call it a door of return, meaning that bridge that we so longed for, that promise that the ancestors made to themselves walking through the door of no return and telling themselves that they will be back home one day, that one day has arrived. They have now placed the bridge, I mean the bridge is now constructed. The gate is now widely open. Let's walk on it and come back home. A lot of our ancestors have been brought back by their own kind, by using the ashes and some relics that they left behind. They brought these two here, had them buried in 1998, and that marked a new era. 2019 was the 400 years of African resilience. In 1619, the very first documented slave ship landed in US Virginia. Between 1619 and 2019, marked 400 years. We celebrated a year of return, and that saw the return of the bones of some ancestors excavated from a mass graveyard in Barbados by the Prime Minister of her, uh, Barbados herself. She brought these bones back to be buried here. Currently, Barbados is an, now a republic nation. We believe that once the ancestors are peacefully resting, they shall hand over whatever we give to them. So then, this woman brought the bones back. Few years later, Barbados is now a free nation, out of the care and the hands of these British vultures. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Devils. <laughs> so, we have them here. In case you have any ashes of your own people with you, you are allowed to go into the ancestral graveyard, sprinkle it all over. Or you take it along to the river, and help them get freed right there in the river. That's what this place stands for. A reverential garden, a place that we find healing. So we shall take the walk to the river where they finally took their last ever bath. We shall go in this direction. So please come with me. Right, family, so that's where we are, family, at Ascend Manso, and that was an introduction to our reconnection tour at Asin Manso, the last bath. And now we are proceeding to the Ancestral River Park. You gonna change?